Hello, everybody, and welcome to Between Two Fans. And the OG Two Fans are back. Steve is back from his uh, hiatus down in Durban. Um, he's actually sitting in a very, very cold Bloemfontein, um, ahead of the most anticipated fixture of the year, Springboks versus Portugal, always a massive one. And <laughs> by Mr. Dan Scholtz, who is sitting in the summery UK um, in a T-shirt. Dan, how are you? Summary, but I, I wish I could say it was warm um, from the warmth of inside the home. But outside, geez, I wish I could say the same. It's been pouring recently. Yeah, well, we can be opposite chat. I don't know what it is about Bloemfontein, but they built their houses obviously in summer and forgot the fact that it gets down to stupid temperatures down here because I was taking what might be the <laughs> coldest house I've ever, ever lived in. <laughs> I'm glad you got some, some, some World Cup rugby merch just to keep you cozy. Yeah, dude. Oh, it's all it's all the layers, all the layers. Uh, basically, last night I had the electric blanket, oil heater, gas heater, fifteen layers, and I was still cold. <laughs> it's getting a bit childish. Yeah, I actually did have a fan on last night because it was that warm. So uh, oh, said, I, I so... will rub it in because I don't ever get to. So sorry, yeah, give sorry. us a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah so then, uh, obviously. Back. Thank Welcome you. Yeah, I missed last week, so I've got no idea what's happening in the predictions. So you're gonna have to give me a whole complete update. And I'm, I've backed my boy Matt to try and catch up for me as well. So tell him, talk me yeah. through it, and and where are we standing, and when are you wearing an all black shirt or an England shirt? <laughs> no, it was a, a valiant effort from old Maddie Hall. Some some might even call it be, beginner's luck, but let's go through them. So we made the prediction, and those who are new around here, we make a prediction every single week across three different of the uh, most anticipated sporting fixtures that weekend or throughout the week. Um, and based on those three, we get a winner each week, and the race is on to 15. The score going into this, Stevie, was 12-11, um, and you actually would have been... Um, very happy to have seen how generous I was with giving you the last one. It was on a it was on a points difference type of metric. So I, I've already handed out a bit of charity to you. Just oh, to come on, you've had you've been living on you. You had those two or three weeks, which was technicality essentials. Don't come here with your answers I'm just, now. I'm just making sure you know it, it, it applies to all. It's it's, it's not specific okay. to me. Um, but let's get through what happened. So first um, prediction was Springbok versus Islands in the second test. Um, the result was 25 points to 24. Ireland squeezing out a one-point victory there. My prediction was boxed by eight, and Maddie's was boxed by 12, so yours was boxed by 12. Um, meaning that I was, you know, points difference, as once again, a little bit closer on that occasion, taking the 1-0 lead. Then we had the England versus New Zealand um, rugby test match at Eden Park. New Zealand going on to win that one and taking the series 2-0. They won that game 24 points to 17. New Zealand's prediction, or my prediction was New Zealand by 11, and Maddie's was New Zealand by 8. His being a little bit closer, um, only one point off to be fair, so he, he's got that one almost bang on the money. So it's 1-1. One, one. Going into the last one, and it was actually the semi-final of the Euros, which was had actually just kicked off, but we were in radio silence and hadn't um, seen any of the um, the stats, although it was 0-0 zero, zero by the time we even finished the podcast. But his prediction was 3-1 um, to England, and mine was 3-1 to Netherlands, result being 2-1 to England, meaning that, Stevie, you won, that, you won last week, thanks to Maddie, and that's two guest appearances and two wins, I'm fairly sure. I had yeah, Andy it is, actually, because... Me over the line. Yeah. And you've had Maddie take you over the line. So it's, 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 it's fair game. And it means that we are tied at 12 all. So, I mean, you couldn't say it's going down to the wire, but very, very excited to see whose um, Arsenal shirt I'm going to get you to wear once I um, put you to that 15 position. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really, really heating up in the, in the predictions. In the... Yeah, listen, um, just glad you backed England because I would have backed England. Um, yeah, no, dude, shout out Maddie Hall. You, you, know, you can come guest parents anytime. And shame, all that momentum that you've brought, you've wrestled back, you've just now gone two two down in a row, hey? So, yeah, yeah unlucky, no, dude. I'm confident. Unlucky, I'm confident. You're, sliding. you're sliding. You're sliding. You're in, the, you're in, you're in, you're in, the, you're in the decline. You, the All Blacks, uh, Liverpool, the works, dude. <laughs> the All Blacks? Well, Correct. I think that's a good transition to say they actually absolutely aren't in decline because they've just clean swept the English. 
Yeah, well, I think I think England have just missed. Let's let's go through the results, and we'll talk a little bit about that England game because I think England's just missed yeah. the best opportunity they're ever going to have to have won the two t- 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 match series in in uh, New Zealand. So, so last week we had our second round of uh, official sort of internationals. Um, some very interesting results. Uh, we had a midweek game where France beat Uruguay, uh, a very experimental France within an experimental French squad. Um, it's a ridiculous tour at the moment. There's been racial incidents. There's been sexual assault allegations. Yeah, it's a lot going on in that French tour. Um, but despite that, they did beat Uruguay in the midweek. Uh, Italy responding uh, for winning, losing that first uh, uh, game the week before to beat Tonga um, over there, which is quite exciting for them. Scotland hammering USA, a um, bit of a shits and giggles to a really for Scotland at the moment in that North American. But the big games were on Saturday. So New Zealand beating England 24 points to 17. Um, some very cool rugby being played, actually. Some very nice tries from England uh, from both their wings. Um, so showing you there's a bit of a, a bit of hope in the way that Steve Borthwick wants to play. Mm-hmm. Um, we then had Australia beating Wales, also a very interesting game. Where I tell you what, I mean, I, I think um, you know Welsh rugby is in a very weird position, but I still think that there's 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 a quality side um, that's going to come out of that that player base very very soon. Um, Japan went down to Georgia, which makes this weekend's game against Australia for Georgia very interesting. Twenty five points to twenty three, and uh, Georgia playing away as well. Then we obviously had the box going down by one point before Argentina did respond from those in the first game. And uh, in Buenos Aires, they beat France 33 points, 25. So a very cool weekend of rugby. Right, then my, my All Blacks in decline story. Um, I think that the All Blacks in the last two weeks have been very lucky to win both of those games. Uh, and I think that England have... Yeah, missed, missed a trick there. I think England played well enough in both tests. Um, the first test, I think, you know, Marcus Smith kicks better off the tee and they win that, uh, which is always sometimes a little bit of an arbitrary analysis, but I think it was very much the case. The, the kicks he missed in particular were were ones that he shouldn't be missing. Um, and I think in that second test, yeah, I mean, a couple of, uh, I mean, that, that Martelaire first try is so, so weak. And yeah, I think a couple Martelaire of chances they're taking. That, that next try, I don't know what the, he thought he was doing. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> he's he's got down the line. options inside and outside, go back to Martelaire, then just pops it straight back into Marcus Smith. So yeah, yeah fair enough, yeah. things do even out. But um, yeah. yeah, I think this All Black side, I'm actually doing a video on today asking if Scott Robertson's on forward watch, which is a bit harsh. But I think what we are seeing, though, is I think people have underestimated how much has actually changed in the New Zealand side, more than just the coaching staff. Aaron Smith, gone. Mm-hmm. Richie Moonga, gone. Brody Retallick, gone. Sam Whitelock, yeah. gone. Sam Cairn. Da- Sam Cairn, injured, yeah, injured at the moment. I think he's injured at the moment. I think he, I think he returns. Oh, uh, yeah. I think he will actually play in the rugby championship. But you look at the you look at the, the World Cup and how important those players were to mm. to that World Cup campaign. I, I think you know they're very much how big of a difference. You know, for example, I mean, I always say you know a lot, a lot of teams are often missing you know a, a world class lock short of being world class. I think Scotland's got that issue, for example. Um, and I think that uh, it's it's such an underrated position in terms of establishing that dominance uh, on the field. And I think that's All Blacks are really missing a couple of massive players and yeah. in a transitional period. And I think they were there for the taking. And England really stuffed it up by not, by not um, getting over the line. Yeah, I think it's always hard to know what the competition looks like in a new World Cup cycle, but also between like the North and South, like mm. they, we've had six nations now, so we kind of have a good idea of, you know, what the ranking system is there. And now we've had like North versus South, but we haven't had the rugby championship, which will be South versus South. So yeah. I think now with the rugby championship, depending on how New Zealand we go against New Zealand, we'll kind of know what type of team they are, right? Because we still kind of, it's like, oh, were England that good or were New Zealand really there for the taking? I mean, um, yeah. And, similarly with, and similarly with was, Australia and uh, Wales, similar kind of vibe, you know, you don't really know, you know, two yeah, in theory well, bad teams or teams, upcoming teams, you don't really know where that actual level of performance mm, is. Mm, mm, mm. And now we've kind of seen the bar set with the South African Island series, you mm. know, one, one, and the, they feel like the two, you know, really ahead of the pack um, nations um, in the world rankings. Um, but, and, and you mentioned that England should have taken this to zero and I plead um, that this is the year that we take the Freedom Cup back from, from New Zealand, because yeah. I think this is also our opportunity to do that. Um, but yeah, I think England could have taken it. I think they're really positive signs there. As you said, in the way Borthwick wants to play that team, the, uh, his selections have been very brave, I think. 
um, and the people that he is getting into that team. It's it's not conservative. It's playing to these players' club level strengths, and it's 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 very exciting. Um, which are all things that you wouldn't have expected to hear from anyone's mouth a year ago under the sport of Grains. Quite exciting things happening for England. I think they missed out on an opportunity, but they they're definitely not going back with their tail between their legs. I think that that goes to show how far they've come um, in the last couple year and a half. So. You know, maybe Borthwick is building something big, but again, as you said, hard to know with like what really re- this Reyes a team mm. is going to look like. <clears throat> Stevie, let's jump into the South Africa versus Ireland series, and now it's been drawn one-one. The result that we did not want as South yeah. African fans, and the result that all the Irish fans were pleading for, and and got, and ultimately um, an absolute humdinger of a game. I mean. One point in it came down to two drop goals from Kieran Frawley. Um, I mean, South Africa were p- behind most of the game. They were 16-6 down at half time. Mm. Um, <clears throat> then eventually turned it around. Every single point um, came off the tee from Andre Pollard's boot um, as we took a five-point lead um, with about eight minutes to go or so. And Kieran Frawley just decided today was his day. You know, he mm. didn't, he, all the times that he's been benched for Leinster, the time that he missed the drop goal in the Champions Cup final, this was his moment. And I think careers are built off of these opportunities you're given and the moments that you create for yourself. And he has just solidified his name in Irish folklore because, my word, what a time to step up and choose that you are the man. You have to tip your hat to him. Yeah, well, I was doing the watch long, and, and even as it happened, I sat there, like, I was almost laughing. I was like, you can't even be mad, you know. I mean, you could be pissed off that, you know, we, we didn't see the game out, but you look at that kind of the, 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 the temperament to be able to pull that out, especially for a player who's had a very weird career. He's not a starter at Leinster, you know. He he comes mm-hmm. off the bench. He's very much a utility player. He doesn't get a lot of game now, time. Though, yeah, I know. I mean, I, 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 I had a rough burn. And the, and and Harry and and Sam Peter. I mean, it's just there's there's too many there's too many tens at, at Leinster for a start. When you think that first of all, by the way, they've had all four of their tens at the moment, and they had Johnny Sexton a year ago. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't see how they don't start him. You know, I think that he's you can see the quality he brings. Um, a proper utility player as well. You know, mm-hmm. um, can mm-hmm. play at 10, 12, 15, for example. So mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I you understand what the value he brings off the bench, but especially at club level, you've got to find a way to 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 play him. Um, you know, he's, yeah. he's, he's too much talent there. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's a game that was sort of slipped from South Africa, which is weird considering the fact they were 16-6 down. Um, but it was a bit of like the sublime to the ridiculous, you know, in terms of we were being completely outplayed in that first half yeah. um, to then completely outplaying them for about 20, 25 minutes where they couldn't. I mean, this is Ireland who don't concede a lot of penalties. They've got one of the best discipline records mm. in the world. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we managed to to score twenty four points off the boot, you know, yeah. uh, largely in like a you know ten fifteen or twenty minute period because they were just there was just relentless pressure where they just couldn't deal yeah. with us. Yeah, um, and of course we so didn't we go gave... for the line at all. And and to be honest, I was I was a part of the brigade. That I was just any penalty, just kick it over, kick it over. Yeah, you know, the, the box are like, and and it, it's so this game was exactly like the spring box in a nutshell. It's like try something new holy shit it's not working and go back just kick 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 get it over yeah. and get this game out the way just go home you know um, yeah well it's test match rugby at the end of the day so you know it's just about if you're not playing well you gotta try and get find that result you know and then you yeah. go back to the drawing board exactly but i mean let's clear this new you know tony brown attacking system had its um you kind of you know showed some cracks this week and and whether it was Ireland just kind of figuring out a little bit more but things just weren't clicking I mean Andre hasn't had um you know obviously unbelievable off, off the boot but I mean the effectiveness of you know Faf playing probably one of his worst games in a Bok jersey Andre you know the, these like I think it was eight kicks inside the attacking 22 zero to hand um it's it's things we're not really used to seeing out of a Springbok camp and just Things weren't quite clicking. As you said, at the beginning of that second half, we managed to get it over. And I think we needed that maybe one try for that extra bit of confidence and, and the real momentum push. But at the end of the day, we left the door open for um, for them to come back. And, and Kieran Flory decided that he was going to do exactly that. I mean, but cheaper, Stevie, did they bring the physicality? I'm willing to say that Ireland 
fucked us up physically because <laughs> we say that to everyone else but my word i mean even i've never seen so much blood out of a human in my life dude i've never seen so much blood in the first like 15 20 minutes of a rugby game dude you had porter they, bleeding off his ear franco mustard blood all over there mls is blood over there i was like dude i would not oh, play on that field it's <laughs> his brother wasn't red it was crazy villy hia you know i mean getting his tackle all sorts of wrong so you know his, his own fault but gone off the field Moss that what we now know is a hairline fracture in his leg and he i mean just a mammoth of a human walked himself off the pitch imagine that no yeah. other sport in the world that would happen peter stepped toy has now been disclosed that he's injured obviously we spoke about chasing Chesn colby had a bit of a knock but he's, he's trained yesterday but also got a bit of a knock yeah, I mean, I mean, they absolutely battered us, and maybe it showed that we picked the exact same twenty-three, and that the physicality of the first test match actually um, kind of overflowed a little bit to the second. But they they brought their A game, so you have to have to give them that credit. Um, but the big one I want to speak about is Malcolm Marks. He's been mm. announced. It's been announced that he has a tibia fracture now, the extent of which we aren't very sure of. Um, but that was a direct result of the double crocodile roll from James mm. Ryan and Caelan Doris. It resulted in um, Caelan Doris getting a yellow card, but it wasn't actually what looks like his one that did most of the damage yeah, I must... from James Ryan, which was afterwards. So I, I'm interested to get your take on what you think the decision should have been from the TMO and, and the referee in that scenario. Did they get it right? Or are we now just thinking it's a bigger thing um, than it is because Marx has now broken his leg? Yeah, look, I think I do think there should be more uh, uh, strict consequences. I, when I look back at it, I mean, a lot of people are talking about the fact that Caleb Doris, you know, halfway through the attempt to crop crawl, kind of gauge that he's not getting it right and then kind of falls into his leg, which it does. I mean, the pictures kind of look a bit like that. It's difficult to know, you know, like if that's the case, if he's sitting there going, oh, you know what, I'm just going to let go here, land on his leg and, you know, break his leg type of thing. You know, I think it's quite a, it's quite an allegation to make. When I watched it first, I thought that um, James Ryan's was far worse and far more clear cut in, I mean, he was, it was, it was as traditional of a crock crawl as it gets, made worse by the fact that Ken Doris was on the leg of Malcolm Marks at the time. So yeah. I didn't actually have as much of an, of an issue with the, the Caelan Doris crock roll, but I looked at the James Ryan one, and that was, if you were to show a, a, a new person into rugby, yeah. when they said, what's a crock roll, you could show you them that and say, this is what a crock roll is. Of what not yeah. to do. Yeah, in that, in that world rugby guide of, you know, video guide of what the rules are, that crock roll for me would be right up there as a perfect example. So I don't understand how that, first of all, wasn't punished. I think a lot of people call it two yellow cards. I think I would have gone with no yellow to Caden Doris, but a red to, to James Ryan. I think that, that his clean out, I thought for me, was horrific. I think I think you look at the Caden Doris one, and it's enough to, in its own, give away a penalty and possibly a yellow yeah. card. But uh, what I think they did, they were like, well, geez. To be honest, they were, they were both pretty similar. I, Granted, I think James Ryan's was worse than yeah. Doris's, but they saw this double incident, the exact same offense, and they were like, well, we can't really give two of the same thing because it just doesn't feel right. So we're just going to give yeah. the first offender, and that's kind of how they worded it, right? They said the initial offender in yeah. the scenario was Caden Doris. He, like, instigated it. But it's like, it's no, it was just like, it's like a double high tackle on the same oak that's just a second apart. Yeah. The offense was equal. So I'd agree. I think it was definitely either a, like, I would have been happy with the thing to either two yellows or um, at least one of them being red or yellow and red because the offenses themselves, James Ryan's was worse, yet he didn't get penalized. Yeah. <clears throat> no, exactly. And I think it's such a bad look for, you know, when you look at, and I'm a big advocate for it, you know, I, I mean, I know people have been very frustrated at the red cards for for head contact, but, you know, it's one of those things where we hit the set, they say it's a necessary evil, you know, if we have to go through two or three years of lots of red cards until these players get their bodies down, stop sort of taking that 50-50 risk by trying to hit a player in the chest and then rising high. That's the biggest problem. People are like, oh, but it's by mistake. I'm like, yes, but if you're going for someone's waist, for example, or below the chest, you can't mistakenly hit them in the head. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's kind of the whole thing that the law is trying to promote is, you know, lower tackles. Similarly, you bring in a law to prevent crop crawls because of the horrific injuries it causes. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you can't sort of weigh up injuries, stuff like that. But, you know, a, a, a red card for a head contact. I mean, obviously, you know, the big thing is obviously head injuries, stuff like that. But I mean, a, a minor concussion, you know, it's a stand down period of sort of 10 days, 11 days. 
you know, um, a crop crawl can rule you out for nine months. It can can actually end your career, to be honest. And, and, and crop crawl is much more, it's much more technique based and it's, it's so much decision more intentional. You can't you can't accidentally crop crawl a guy. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, you, it's don't, you don't you don't go cleaning and then like halfway through you go, oh shit, yeah. I slipped and just happened to grab him and just flip him. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and say that that's the reason why the box lost and that would have resulted in a different outcome because. The fact of the matter is, Kaden Doris was the only one who got a yellow card. Both of them had an immense game. And Kaden Doris, to be honest, fair bloody play to him, being named as captain. and a great game. Taking over the home as a beast. And you know what? He might have even just put himself in the front running for to be the next British and Irish Lions captain. Yeah, look, I think that, that clip where um, Andy Farrell spoke about him, and you can see, like, Doris looked at him like, shit, okay. Um, you know, I think there's there's obviously a very very good relationship between them because mm -hmm. I don't think he was an obvious candidate. Can I mean I know he captain before the Six Nations, but I don't think a year ago people would have been looking at Ken Doris as an obvious yeah. candidate for captain. Um, people talk like about James Ryan actually with like Gary Ringrose for Leinster like a couple times, yeah, which was also yeah. just a ridiculous thing to him. Yeah, we all, we, we know we, people yeah. understand how much we despise the co-captains oh, and the fifteen vice captains, captains we have currently at the moment. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it, is on, it is on our agenda to 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 get rid of. But, um, yeah. yeah, look, at the end of the day, it's, and I thought, especially, you know, you to, for it to have happened to Marx, who's just come back from a knee injury, you know, you just shut it and you just sit there saying, like, you've, you've got, to, got to, to do more than that to, to try and clamp this down. Because um, yeah. hopefully it's nothing serious. We, we, know it's, we know it's tibia fracture, but again, there's, there's levels to the, the game. I mean, Rassi was talking about the fact that Frank Boss got a broken leg, but he's back in six weeks. You know, I don't imagine it's exactly like a clean break and type of thing, especially the way he walked off the field. So we don't know the extent of the injuries, but hopefully there's nothing too serious for Malcolm because we need to get him back on, uh, on the park. But uh, Dan, we want to do something which I think is going to cause a lot of uh, chat and debate. Uh, and, and should we try attempt to pick a combined 15 across the two tests? Let's do it, Stevie. And it was quite funny preparing for this because, you know, you naturally one has to get all the teams across, you know, the two different games. Um, but it was quite easy for the string boss because they picked the <laughs> yeah, I, Literally, I, I, saw, I saw your show notes and I was like, well, there's the two island teams. One, uh, of course, okay, yeah, I know that was easy. <laughs> I don't even know which game the screenshots <laughs> from could be either of them. Um, literally. But, and, and, and to be honest, mostly um, it wasn't that much of a change to, to the island team either. So let's start with number one, and that's going to be versus Ox and Chair and Andrew Porter. Um, are we both happy we're going with Ox there? Yeah, um, I think Schwaben wise was more dominant across both tests. Um, had I mean, man of the match the second test, so I don't think that you know it's even really a candidate. I um, really enjoyed Ox's Ox's work. I think he's somebody who's had to come through a lot of adversity. You know, part of that Wales test and his debut fell out of the box system, and now for me, one of the best loose sets in the world. Um, scrummaging is phenomenal. He gets around the park as well. Got asked the question about uh, how he feels about the scrums not functioning. Gave a very very polite. Okay. Yeah. Basically, and I, and I, and I think it's still searching mood. for that journey. Yeah, but not in the mood at all. Okay, well, let's, let's agree on that. Um, two, are we going to go? I mean, Dan Sheehan went off with his SEO injury. You probably can't give it to him. Ronan this is this is the hardest one for me because I thought it was a test Mark. of... Well, I don't know. I think, I think to be fair, outside shot, I thought that um, Ronan Kelleher was really, really good in the second test. Yeah. Uh, I agree, and and massive massive boots to full. So I'm 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 happy to actually pass that. Yeah, because I, I think... thought if you're going to be brutally honest, I thought Bongi and Malcolm both had all right tests, but nothing particularly special. Yeah, um, no, whereas I was no, really I'm... impressed by Ronnie Callahan's second test, especially after having committed that very controversial penalty in the first test. I think that he, in fact, many many Irish supporters are actually saying that you know we've actually we're so up in the in the hype of Dan Shea, he's quick around the park and very exciting that yeah. that sometimes maybe they they miss the just pure grunt. Of Kelly, yeah. so yeah, I, I, I think I think he deserves to be in there. Happy to go with that. Um, tight head. We got Franz Herber versus Taj Furlong. Um, yeah, look, I think. Well, actually, I think I think to be honest, I think this is actually probably more Taj Furlong against Vincent Cock because I think Vincent Cock probably actually had a better, especially with the, with the rock props. You pay like a similar amount of minutes across the two games. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think probably Ty Furlong probably gets it. Uh, Again, not a position where I think too many people stood up. Uh, Vincent Cock had some nice moments, in, especially in that scrum in the, in the second, in, the, in that first test towards the end. Yeah. But over over the 160 minutes, probably tied. But I, but I don't think by much. 
Yeah, no, it, it is a split decision. And to be honest, let's, let's get a couple of Irish names in there because I have a feeling that we're going to be not picking too many more. Well, hopefully. Um, number four, um, we've got Irwin versus Joe McCarthy. Surely it's got to be Irwin. I was actually a bit disappointed with Joe McCarthy's mm. tour. I was really, really, ex and, and expecting him to be one of the players that walked away from this tour that everyone's like, okay, he's yeah. actually officially world-class now. Um, After the Six Nations, I was like, this guy for me was the guy to watch in the pack. Like we know what Josh Van Fleer does. We know what Karen Doris brings, for example, and, and like the mm. front rows. But I thought that in the, in the especially in Six Nations, I looked at Joe McCarthy and I was like, I'm very keen to see what he can do. And he mm. was very quiet. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and give that to Eben. At five, we have James Ryan, Taj Byrne, who obviously played at five in the first test, um, versus Franco and or Achia's name. I know, okay, yeah, who played. Um, yeah. Who, play, who played quite a lot of minutes. Um, who, who, who are you pushing with? I, I think I'm willing to go Byrne despite moving, playing at flank. I think he was probably the next best lock or just player on the field whilst also playing lock. Yeah, I think if Franco played the full second test, I think he'd probably have a good a good um yeah good case for it. Yeah. I think he was very good in the I think in the, based on the first test, I want to give it to him. I think he was, I think he was somebody we really missed in this test. To be perfectly honest, you know, I think it's amazing how somebody who's a lot of people didn't rate for long to him because they said he was lightweight. I mean, he's now gone up to play almost eighty tests and become such an important. He's he's like he's like that, that like, small too. little cog. Huh? What? That's crazy. He's one of the seventies. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Who would have thought? He's one of the wow. most experienced players in the I mean, in, I in love, the side. I love Flanco, bro. What a beast. Yeah, no, I, I mean, some of these collections are unfortunately just due to time in the field, and you know, he he went off very early in that in that second test, so yeah. not able to really assert his dominance in the second one. Um, let's go to um, open side. So that's going to be Josh van der Fleer versus Sia Colisi. And then we've got to give it to Sia, right? That first game. Basically okay. based on that first test. Yeah, the second test I think was a bit, I think he himself was pretty disappointed with his performance. But similarly, yeah. I thought Josh van der Fleer had a very, had a pretty quiet tour by his standards. Look, to be fair, yeah. I mean, it's funny how we're saying quiet tour. I mean, we're talking about two tests where basically no, there were no real bad players. I mean, yeah, each test, some players that we had sort of subpar performances. Mm -hmm. but which I think maybe shows you how, how close the, the series was. You know, there no. was no opportunity necessarily to be such a big standout player. But yeah, I think Sia, especially based on that first test, probably gets it for me. Yeah, I agree. And then um, we kind of at at, at um, blind side we're going Peter Steff versus Pierre Mani, and I guess then again it's Taj Burn. So again, I mean you got to go with Peter Steff, right? Oh, yeah, that's not even competition. Did. He's, I mean, he was phenomenal across both tests. The, the the work rate, the pace he's now showing down the down on the fringes. The yeah, no, he's just he's just in the next yeah. level player. Mental at eight. Quacker versus Kaden Doris. I mean, a lot of question marks now about whether Quacker can really fill that number eight role. It's yeah. really it's the biggest question mark in terms of what the Springboks are going to be doing to, you know, replacing um, Dwayne Vermeulen. Obviously, we have Jasper Visa coming back into the mix, but mm. it does show that there is a bit of a, perhaps a lack of depth, although there is still Cameron Hanacombe and Evan Lewis <laughs> waiting in the rings. But I think this one has to go to Doris, right? Yeah, I think so as well. Although I think I do think Quark has got an unnecessary amount of criticism. I think what what I was saying to some is I think what the Ireland did so well is nullify his game. And mm. not just his game, they the breakdowns. They were so, so good at the breakdowns. <laughs> Frank Moss even mentioning in his press conference last week that I mean Malcolm Marks is arguably one of the best breakdown artists in the world. And I think he had one turnover across both tests. You know, Quacker Smith as well. Last year, he had the most, most turnovers in, in world rugby, and they, he couldn't really get into that side. I mean, he slowed the breakdown. I thought the second test, actually, it was weird how people were complaining about the second test, because I think second test, he did absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, he took everything out the, out the sky. Um, he, I think he carried one of the most meters of four, four Bach. He had that, yeah. you know, into that, that charge down. I thought he actually had a pretty decent game in the second test. But the problem is everybody, you know, we, we're used to the big bruising number eight. Um, yeah. And I think the interesting thing is that, you know, we're trying to replace it to Anthony Muren, who was a, it was a freak, you know, very reliable off kickoffs and under the high ball, incredibly good defensive awareness and defensive organizational skills, big leader, incredibly mm -hmm. physical on the attack and very good at the breakdown. We don't have an eighth man that ticks all those boxes because there aren't lots of eighth men that tick all those boxes. You know, the closest is probably Cameron Hanukum, who I still, I mean, who still for me has a little bit of work to do from an experience point of view, because he's so young. But you're going to lose something across all of those players. You know, a Jasper Visa versus a Quaker Smith versus Evan Lewis, they've all got their own sort of skill yeah. sets, but you're never going to just sort of replace Dwayne Vermeulen. Yeah, no, he will. Um, he will and I think. 
and probably the yeah. best ever I can remember ever in like Springbok history. Just uh, unbelievable. Never mind his rugby brain to go with it. Yeah, let, let's go on to number nine. See, that's really Faf versus um, well, Craig Casey versus or Conor Murray, Conor Murray. Um, because he he probably played the most most <laughs> minutes after um, Casey went off with his concussion. I mean, I think it's got to be Conor Murray who also just I mean, scored so score many um, haters and. I yep. said they are replacing the most vulnerable position with someone with over a hundred caps for Ireland. So I wouldn't be worrying. And he turned out another yeah. unbelievable performance. And everyone said he couldn't play in this Irish team with the pace of play um, that he that he brings compared to Jamie Gibson Park. But bringing bringing his X factor in different areas, kicking game was unreal. Um, so it's cool to yeah, try the first fair, test. Fair to Conor Murray, um, because yeah, no, I think that. people. We would have thought that yeah, he would I think, have I think, I think, it's an, I think the one. biggest problem is, you know, he kind of like suffers. It's like the, it's like the issue that we've seen in France where he kind of suffers with the condition where he's not James Gibson Park. You know, yeah. it's like some of the, like some of the French nines suffer with the condition of not being Antoine Dupont. It's yeah, just like, well, exactly. you know, like, sorry that the guy can't be like one of the current, be the kind of one of the mm. best players in the world, but he's such a class act and so calm and collected. For me, the next one, this next one is interesting because Pollard had a bit of a, if you're going to be very honest, a bit of a stinker in the first game. Um, no, struggled a little bit good. in and around the game in the open play in the second game it kicked very well Crowley had some very good moments but I didn't think it was his best tour you know kicked, kicked, it was probably better in the second test as well, as well. It, I'll probably give it to Crowley on the balance yeah. um, it's like the only time that you feel Crowley would ever beat Andre and now I'm looking at this and it's looking very light green and not very dark green Stevie so I'm a little bit worried but I think we'll, we'll come back in the in the latter half of this but yeah you know, I, I agree I just think Andre didn't play as well off the boot second test unbelievable really really good but missed um missed some kicks and ball in hand was largely ineffective over both games for the Springboks which you very very rarely say about him so um yeah very, very um surprised I guess in that but um, moving on to, let's, let's actually go through the centres before we get into the wings. Um, 12, um, it was Damien Dialindi, and in the first game, it was Bandiaki, and in the second game... Yeah, well, to be fair, you know, we talked about it not being very dark green. I think this is where it gets dark green, because I don't think yeah. you can go anything besides Damien Dialindi, Jesse Creel's centres. I think that's easy. Yeah. That's, I will not listen to anything. I thought Gary Ringrose was very really disappointing on Saturday, because I actually love watching him play, and I thought he was a bit average. I thought Bandiaki in the first test was a shadow of Bandiaki who used to see him. He even made a couple mm. of mistakes. You could see he was annoyed with himself. Yeah. Robbie Henshaw was class and, and I think was very good. He was the strongest of the three centers. But I thought Damien and Jesse had two strong games. I agree. I agree. I think that both of their, I mean, just that combination is, is, is you know, time, you know, stood the well, test of literally time is. as well. So we'll go for them both in the, in the center pairing. And then, of course, we have the wingers. So... We had Holby and Lawrence, they, um, they had Calvin Nash and James Lowe. Um, let's start with the 11 position, which is the most difficult, I'd say, is currently um, versus... Because um, Jason also... Unless you want to move one of them to the other one. Yeah, well, Jason, Jason and Curtis swap swap jerseys like it's going out of fashion. I mean, they, they swapped jerseys last weekend, for example. So I think we can basically... That, that they wear the same scrum cap Try, try, try commentating, dude. You need one of you guys. Your similar builds, like when, when, it's like it's one of those things when it's, when it's the far out ones, and you kind of usually try and base it on the side of the field they are. When it's yeah. the, the, the the establishing shot, it's difficult. As soon as you cut it a bit closer, you can kind of see the small difference in the scrum. Yeah, the, way. the medium shot. It's the it's the medium distance. Yeah, the shot medium shot. It's, yeah, it's that's that's possible. that's tough. I mean, out they don't here. have the exact same body type, but compared to like compared to each other they're actually not that similar but compared to everyone else on the field they are very yeah, similar. exactly everyone exactly when you've got when you've got that wide angle and all you're seeing is a scrum cap flying down the wing <laughs> yeah no it's, um it's, it's so really i think funny. my suggestion would be and it's gonna have to you're gonna have to say his name because i'm not gonna say it, but i think we're probably gonna <laughs> go at chairs and colby and then that stupid little new zealand winger for for ireland <laughs> who oh, wow. came out and talked talk shit about the box. And it's so yeah, annoying because ever since I said, like, he had a really average few games in the World Cup and I was like, this guy's finished. And since then, he's decided to just flip and turn it on. It's just pissing me off. No, you have to admit he's turning it on. So we're going to go James Lowe and then you you would, you would go with Chessie over Curti. Yeah, I think that first test, you know, um, that the try created, you know, the work that he gets through, 
Um, okay. I think I think he was stronger across the two tests than than Kurt and was. We can them in their in their natural positions then as well. Um, and then Jamie Osborne versus Billy Larue, and this has to go only one way, Stevie, because Jamie Osborne announced himself to the rugby world and said, "I don't care if it's my debut tour. I don't care if my debut was in the first test versus Loftus. I'm going to absolutely come to South Africa and ball out." I mean, he was instrumental, and you know. Nine times out of ten, I think he gets him out of the match for that final final game um, because it's usually mm. a linear to the winning team, and I think he was their probably their best player. Um, and Vili um, didn't didn't play know, feature in the fair. second test as well, so yeah. um, you know had a had a decent first test, but um, I think you have to give it to Jamie Osborne across across both tests. Um, Sasha obviously came in and had a decent game at fifteen, um, but I think you have to give it to Jamie Osborne there. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the first test, you know, took him a while to settle set into things. Had a couple of of tough moments, but um, yeah, by the end of it, I thought was was really he decided looks made for for Test Rugby, for example. Um, mm. So yeah, I was I was, I was impressed with um, with him. So I'm just trying to count how many we've got in each one. Yeah, so let's go through it. We've got we're going to our, our combined team: Ox, Kelleher, Furlong, um, in in the front row. Then we've got Irvin and Tajburn. The SA Island pairing. We, on the back three, you've got Sia, Peter Steff, um, and then at the back, Kaylee Doris. At 9 10, we've got the Island combo, Conor Murray Crowley. In the centres, we have the South African pairing of Theo Lindy Krill. Um, 11, um, 14, and 15, we've got James Lowe, Colby, and Osborne, respectively. So, Stevie, that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it's 7, 8. 7, 8 Irish players and 7 South African mm. players. Wow, that's actually shocking by us. Um, but I mean, they did draw the series. Um, and I think, I think honestly, largely it was based off them injuring half of the players who had a good test yeah. in the first one and weren't able to feature in the second one. So they, they, they edged out a couple of, a couple of those spots. So good, good series from Ireland. And, um, I'm just so bummed that we're not playing them in November now in, in Dublin, because I think that would have just been blockbuster. Um. Yeah, I think, I think next case. year's. I think I think they'll try and get a test next year, and it's going to be a proper grudge match by the time we get there. Yeah, no, it's going to be it's going to be unbelievable. Anyway, Stevie, let's let's move on to the Springboks playing this weekend versus our long-standing rivals, Portugal, where yeah. we have named <laughs> the long-standing Ooh. rivals and our first ever test against them. Yeah, <laughs> um, we've named seven debutants and a brand new captain, um, and so it's a very fresh-looking team. Yeah, it's. I like it. You know, um, I think uh, a couple of people having a bit of a freak out about the likes of Kuros Raila, a Trevor Nikani, for example, all the players who are involved. But last year, I basically said, well, I've got us Kukuba, like basically almost 45 to 50 players who they've earmarked as the next group for the next four years. And he said, it's up to the senior players to show them that they are still good enough to be in the mix, you know, and mm-hmm. they can't do that if they're not given a chance, you know. I mean, Kubis Rana had another very good season in the top 14. Now, yes, it's just, I mean, do I think he's around the Export Cup? I mean, in theory, he could be. I Jeez. probably don't think so. I think I think Trevor, for example, won't be. Um, mm. But I also think there's a certain amount of, and this is maybe something, that, you know, it is a certain amount of, that's been more jersey is still very valuable. Hey? And you, we don't want to be giving away caps for the sake of giving away caps. And I know we want to build depth, and I know we want to sort of, you know, see what uh, the next generation is. But at the end of the day, you know, he still want, we're not playing against New Zealand twice a year. That for me is not building uh, experience exercise. That is yeah, who are wanna, best 23 players to beat New Zealand. Playing New Zealand, I want to see Trevor playing New Zealand. Yes, um, you know. Um, and but but I also want to see Jan Hendrik Vessels playing alongside Trevor, which is kind of what's happening now. You know, yeah. you, you, you're not only learning from them on the field, but I mean the amount of wisdom that they must be passing on in the training ground and the standard that this mm. team has set is also carrying the weight and the reputation for what future Springboks should expect to, um, you yeah. know, kind of the level of performance and professionalism to being carried through while they're coming through the ranks and, and, and setting their own standards. But let's quickly chat about Simon Murat and someone we have spoken about kind of just seems to walk into a Springbok camp without really a man of the match performances at a, at a provincial level. Um, I mean, we know he's, the talent is there and the potential is 
but he feels like that player who's never had to over overperform or overshine to gain at his yeah. back into camps and whenever he's fit he's there and now being named as the Springbok captain and the first ever Muslim captain as he becomes the 66th person to captain the Springboks I mean everyone around him speaks about his professionalism his leadership abilities I'm interested in the discussion around why someone like Harold was picked over Lucanio Am and do you think that's because we see someone right as potentially someone to take the reins over from Sia Polisi on a permanent basis. So I think it's very simple when it comes to why Lukanya Am wasn't picked. The Kanye Am playing at outside center, someone was playing at lock. Rasi Erasmus doesn't know backline players as captains. You know, Andre Pollard is like the official vice captain of Verdicom. He's always seen next to Rasi Erasmus almost in every single team voter as like your de facto vice captain. And mm -hmm. yet the minute Sia Polisi goes off of the field, it becomes Eben. It becomes Peter Steph the toy. It was Dion Faree. That's Bongi mm -hmm. Minambi. You know, Rassi mm -hmm. just wants his captain to be close to the referees. He wants him to be in the scrum. He wants him to be in the lineups, for example. So I think, you know, the only other candidate really at a very, very big push is if you look at the pack, somebody like, you know, what, Thomas Atoy, you know, who's back in the camp now. He's been around the block uh, and as captain of the Sharks, for example, but, you know, he's only back in the camp for the first time now you know, since since the World Cup. Yeah, and I mean, is, are you going know, to name Arcus' name as a captain? No, you just want I mean, I don't to think be he... Willie. You want to yeah, be exactly. the body and the chaos. So I think that, you know, it's it's about dealing with the referee, for example, and stuff like that. Look, if you talk about rugby, a football heritage, we always talk about. This is rugby heritage. You know, Salmarat comes from a long line of, of a family who's played sorry mm -hmm. rugby during sort of the, the isolation period, played for yeah. Western Province. He's captain SA under 20, SA schools, as well as the Stormers. So... Mm -hmm. He's he's not accidentally a captain, you know. He's obviously somebody who walks into a room yeah. and everyone goes, you know, oh shit, he's here. And he's obviously somebody that when he talks, listen to, you know, that's what everybody keeps telling us that he's incredibly mm. his presence. So, look, I think that he's someone who has been fast tracked into the system over the years. Sometimes, um, and, and as you mentioned, I don't think he's always had to. It's difficult to say he hasn't had to earn it because you obviously don't just go out and as someone get into a swimmer camp. But as you yeah. mentioned, some players have had to be. I mean, everyone was, you know, URC player of the season, not in the block camp. A couple yeah. of years ago, Snare and Humber, URC player of the season, not in the bot camp. You know, you've got players mm -hmm. who are, you know, doing man of the match performances almost every single week, not getting bot camps. And you've got someone yeah. like him who got a little bit more under the radar. I think that they saw his potential very early. A little bit like Yad Hendry Vessels, you know, who's never played a URC game yeah. or a Champions Cup or yeah. Champions Cup game yeah. at Lucid in his career, started Lucid for the box. <laughs> it's, so it's, that, this is the craziest story for me. And I'm so excited to see what happens. And it's hard to know what, how we can measure. Um, you know, again versus Portugal, but it's just a it's a it's a nut selection for Jan Hendrik Vessels and and excited to see what he can do there. But everyone else we've kind of seen a lot of and performing at that URC level, bar him, because we just haven't seen almost any of him in a blue ball yeah. shirt yet. Yeah, he is and always a hooker. Football. Yeah, yeah, and always as a hooker. I mean, that's that's supposedly what his big attraction is. He can play both prop and hooker. Listen, if, if we get this one right, it could be insane. And probably uh, other mm. than John Smith, the, the, I can't think of anyone else in memory that can really play between those, those two positions. So, yeah, pr pr pretty yeah. amazing. So I've got, I've got four exciting picks in this in this team um, that I'm watching out for this weekend. There's obviously more, um, and I've had to bring it down to four. Because, I mean, you know, if I start saying five or six, it becomes like half a bloody team. But I think that for me, I think Ben Jason Dixon is a, is, is a very exciting one player to watch, especially more because of the injury to Peter Staff the toy. Because yeah. I think if Ben Jason Dixon goes well this weekend, I, I would have no issue whatsoever in playing him against Australia two tests. And then right now, tomorrow, if it's the All Blacks test, I would say I'd back him. I think mm. I'm such a big Ben Jason Dixon fan. I've been watching him for a couple of years now. This season, the last season, it's like watching Peter Staff the toy with dark hair and a moustache. <laughs> you know, it's he honestly like a player profile live is similar. almost identical. No, and no one's gonna sit there saying he's the next PSD at the toy because you know that's like saying, you know, he's gonna be the next world player of the year. But I just think from a profile point of view, in terms of his output and what he does, yeah. he is PSD at the toy reincarnate. So I'm very excited about him. I think uh PSD with Lazy, also somebody but like someone Rats who was also, former captain, but he was sort of touted. Oh, cool, there it is. That's our Sir Khaleesi replacement. He was going to captain the Springboks one day. He's going to play Springboks. And it's taken a bit longer. He's now, particularly yeah. in the new Tony Brown system. Out in the, yeah, out in and the I, think, I think he's had to bulk up a bit as well. You know, I think when he first played as an under 20, you could see the skills in the player there, but I thought he was a bit lightweight, especially when he started coming mm -hmm. into the shops early on. Uh, I think he's had to bulk up a little bit. So I think it's taken a bit longer than probably even he would have liked to have gotten into the system and got this chance. Um, look, no so much more than like Aaron Krobola, who got his first call up three years ago. 
But no, no, fine. Pepsi and Ben Jason Dixon, they excite me. And then off the fa- off the bench, um, I think Mornay Fundenberg. They, fine I think they really boy. rate him. I think that yeah, I don't, I'm not just because I'm just just you know, watching watching the the block training and when everyone's warming up, he has like he gets up there quite early, warms up quickly, and he's with stick and he's passing and he's working. Uh, when I when I when I went to a Bulls press conference, the box were training. It wasn't supposed to be an open training, but they were obviously training next door, and I watched for a bit, and he was running at nine a lot. So I think that he, I think they're looking at him and Grant mm-hmm. Williams and probably Jaden Hendricks. So I think those are our three show marks moving forward uh, long term. And I think Morning Vandenberg and Grant Williams actually at the moment could even have the inside track given the injury to Jaden Hendricks. Sir. And I think that Morning Vandenberg um, and Grant Williams suit Tony Brown a lot. I think he's someone who snipes very nicely. He's got good, he's got very, very good skill set. I mean, as you just talked about his technical ability. And so he's got proper, he's a really good passer of the rugby ball, which every scrum up has to be, but he has that in abundance. And then my last one is the surprise call up to the squad. First call up to the squad yesterday, named in the on the bench, is Ruan Yeah, Mammoth, 21 years old as well. I mean, to yeah. be that size at 21 is just ridiculous. Um, yeah, I mean, I was at training yesterday, and he's, like, walking around, and he, like, walked walked past Evan, and obviously he's shorter, but you, like, look at those two, and you're like, man. if I was in a bar, and those two were mates, and one of them grabbed <laughs> me, I think I would, I think I would just... I don't even know what I do. I would just say, yeah, "Listen, yeah. give me two seconds to sort my will, and then we can continue." Well, because can you see bust, bro. Um, dude, it's just he's an absolute unit. I mean, he announced himself. I think he was nineteen when he sat down Hamish Watson, like a few months after Hamish Watson went through the yeah. entire six days without missing a tackle. He had that, he had that ridiculous length of time of international games out of tackle. That mm-hmm. year, he sat him down mm-hmm. at nineteen years old, and we all went, "Okay." Yeah. <laughs> so, so this guy's Tomorrow. arrived. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting team. And, you know, another notable mention to Andre Hufa who will be following in his father's footsteps. Andre Fenta, who played 66 tests for South Africa, um, and he'll become the 16th father-son combination to play for mm. the box. But other debutants, so Jan Hendrik Bessel, um, Jan Hrabela, um, Pepsi Butelezi, then, of course, it's um, Kuan Horn and Mornay van der Berg and Ruan Fenter and Andre Hugo Fenter, sorry. Um, <laughs> so all, all seven of those um, will be new Springboks as of this week. And it's only 228 caps amongst the 23 compared to 990 last week. So probably one of the yeah. least capped versus last week, which is the most capped ever. Um, but yeah, very, very excited for, for the next game and the last game before the rugby championship starts. Stevie, let's jump into the Euros. Um, can Spain. we not? Can we just can we just, can we just skip on and just pretend that yeah, no, it, it never, never happened? Coming home. It was never coming home. Don't bore yourself. Although uh, I was in an English pub and became an English fan throughout the game just because I was like, well, the vibes are going to be pretty immaculate if England got to win. If um, England win, yeah. It would be pretty iconic to be a part of, you know, everyone saying, oh, public holiday, public holiday, I'm coming up. But I don't know. For me, it's quite simple. At the end of the day, I think England were not the best team of the tournament. I think Spain were the best team of the tournament. Taking yeah, but ironically, I thought that final, was... And they outplayed them in the final. Um Quickly, just to a high-level summary, a, a goal early on in the second half by the 19-year-old Nico Williams um, was followed by a goal by Cole Palmer, who was subbed on in the 73rd minute, and then Ayar Bashal, um in the 80, 86th minute um, took home the winner. Um, so uh, 2-1 was the result. Stevie, talk to me. Mm. Yeah, I think frustrating game, a uh, frustrating tournament for England, uh, and it's and it's, it's an interesting one because international football is such an interesting. It's almost like a different type of football to club football. It's so different, you know. You can't build teams with transfers, for example. You don't get months and months and months of preseason stuff like that to get it right. It's so different, to like international rugby versus club rugby. So international football is such a results based, purely results based uh, game, you know. And England have, I mean, some people sort of sort of flipped their way through the tournament, but. You know, have not you know have found ways of winning, have found ways of getting through, and I think it was just one step too far. Um, so it's an interesting one because obviously Gareth Southgate walked away, so that that will change with whatever he's been begging for. He will leave as arguably the most successful English manager since the, the you know sixty six in terms of playoff games, finals, and stuff like that. So there's no doubt this England team is on the rise. Because I think, you know, the, the experience they'll get from playing two Euros finals, getting to the World Cup semifinals, you know, these players are going to be hungrier yeah. than ever. But I do think that there were some selection issues. And I think, you know, it's a generational. People talk about a generation where I think there's almost too much 
in certain positions and then they don't quite know what to do with them. Um, mm-hmm. And it kind of showed a little bit in the final. The Spanish side, again, you know, you talk about, you know, how you know, managers and stuff like that. We're talking about a manager who came through the Spanish system and basically has yeah, been with these, a lot of these guys for years and years and years, similarly to Southgate in many ways in terms of being those junior structures, knowing these players backwards. And I think it shows you how important it is from an international perspective to know these players and to and to back these players because these players will kind of reward you. It's not as simple yeah. as just, you know, you can go and get, I mean, people are talking about like a, a, a Jurgen Klopp going to England. Jurgen Klopp doesn't walk into England side and all of a sudden they win the World Cup. You know, it's, it's so it's so not that simple. Klopp does not want that position. He no. does not want that position. And to be honest, this one, I mean, all international football managers, it's, it's a tough gig because so many countries care so much and it's cutthroat. Yeah. You need not a lot of time, as you mentioned. And it has resulted in, in obviously Southgate resigning or stepping down or asked to step down. I'm actually not quite sure which one it was, but he, I, I called it last week. I thought win or lose, I thought it would be his last game. And I genuinely think if he won the Euros, he would also choose, would have chosen to have stepped down. I think he was just the, the amount of media um, negativity. That you don't want this England job, hey? It is a cut. I think, I think, I think it's the hardest job in world football. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I don't think it's any easier than the, than the French or, or Brazilian one, kind of also where those expectations are that high, but that English. Yeah, but with the Brazilian one, you know, you've got you've got you've got players who are just generational. You just go and say vibes, boys, garden vibes. Carlo Ancelotti's yeah. going to boss a Brazilian job one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I think listen, credit where credit's due. Um, he won more knockout games at major competitions than any England manager in the past forty years. Um, yeah. combined, I think it was. So like, you have to take that into perspective. I think he's just, I think what he did, he got England back to a place where they were as competitive as they should be. I think everyone yeah. else, which is why I don't think he necessarily overperformed because I think the English English squad and team are capable of winning something. And I think they probably should have, um, but he got them back playing the football and actually believing a little bit more, which I think and everyone is kind of, you know, applauded him for was his human nature. And yeah, and the culture side, the, the cultural shift that he's done, yeah. you know, remove that sort of club rivalry issue that we had during exactly. the Lampard era, the Moody stuff like that. So I think he's done that. I think he's laid foundations, which if they get the, the decision right, stands them in a really good stead for the World Cup because I think everyone he's, he's built back, a good culture. Yeah, everyone will look back at his reign as the turning point if England going mm. to win something now. And he will get a lot of credit, I think, for that, even though he won't be the manager who will be the team, the, the, the manager to get, get them over the line. Um, yeah. But yeah, well done to Spain. Yamal, 17 years old, living the dream. Um, another a, a great final by him. I mean, Nico Williams is so exciting. I was very impressed. Yeah, I, with, I, I um, love watching him in this tournament. It's so good. Avara Morata, I was incredibly impressed. He didn't actually have the greatest final, but I was incredibly impressed by his maturity but to have those two young wingers and let them play, he was almost playing in like a false nine position, but a bit of an agent of, of chaos and just linking people together. That midfield, even though they miss Pedri, you know, the Danny Olmos, the, I mean, Kukurea stepping up um, from the back. And then, um, of course, Carver held. Just, I feel like he's the new Sergio Ramos, absolute shit heart. But yeah. what you need to get it over the line and, and, and yeah, <laughs> being the chill, exactly. But yeah, well done, well done to Spain. And then, of course, They're Argentina. Back winning the Copa America back to back for them. And that is four trophies on the bounce, um, two Copa Americas, World Cup and a La Decima. So um, they won that one nil in a chaotic final, which started out with a two hour delay because the stadium um, organizers couldn't prevent all the um, Colombian and Argentine fans from storming the stadium. People who ro- arrived at their seats to a bunch of people who were s- already sitting there. There were people who couldn't get in, who had tickets, absolute chaos, um, and a real question mark an hour around um, how they're going to you know, cater to the um, World Cup in a couple of years. Um, but Argentina going on to win that one, 1-0. One um, and Messi going off in the mid 60 minute, going over his ankle. I don't know if you've seen the video, Stevie, but my yeah. word, I've never seen an ankle operate like that. It was huge. So, I mean, he was in tears, but as a, as a Messi fan boy, couldn't be, couldn't be happier. Um, him and cheap as that Argentine team is good. Yeah, no, it's proper. Um, any team that's got to, you know two United stars and Sandro Martinez and Alejandro Garnacho, you know the next Messi. It's they're going to win a lot of trophies coming up. Um, <laughs> no, Martinez has no interest in playing for United. 
injured the whole yeah. season and then goes on to win the Copa America. Well, no, it's, it's not like, a single it's, injury inside. It's it's the archiest name in the football, you know. <laughs> <laughs> even, even 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 Luke Shaw was like that for England, you know. He hasn't played for United since December. Yeah. Yeah, goes yeah, to the Euros yeah, yeah. and look I mean look Lemar had that assist in the second half but in the first half the best player in the tournament walked in the pitch Luke Shaw said nah not today and it was like dude where have you been like you yeah. thought you were dead no him no, um, no. and Gareth have a special bond um, yeah but, yeah, that, but then on to your side is tend to either do only well for club or only well for country and country yeah Miss Lissandra Martinez I mean jeepers an unreal tournament from him. Yeah, it's 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 very funny that unfortunately, he, well, fortunately for me as a Liverpool fan, that he doesn't put it on as often for, for United. Well, he does when he plays. He just hasn't played, bloody bastard. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. But speaking of play, Dan, can we talk about the fact that the the, the new generation of te- of tennis is officially in, and my boy Carlos Alcaraz is about to win forty five majors in the next, you know, what, ten years. 12 years, 13 yeah. years, I think it will be if he had to yeah. win every single major. I, I do love a bit of Alcaraz, and obviously he went on to win um, this Wimbledon final in straight sets, 6 2, 6 2, 7 6 in the tie break. Um, and to be honest, I mean, the complete opposite of what it was last year, which was the, a mammoth battle, which was really that felt like the kind of passing of the baton, um, or Alcaraz stealing the baton off of Djokovic last year. Yeah. And, um, Djokovic, I mean, listen, he's fresh off an injury. About a month ago, he had a, he had a knee surgery. So the fact that he got to finals is insane. But just those first two sets just never looked up for it. So many um, unforced errors couldn't win a point at the net. Very un Djokovic like the amount of um, errors he was making. And Alcaraz w- was playing decently, not out of his socks, not to the best of his ability. But Finally, in the final set, there seemed to be a bit of a game on, and and Jock showed a bit of fight well, to come back. Now, out. you wish that was the first set. Yeah, I mean, Alcaraz should have put it away. I mean, he was serving for the match. Yeah, and he had like yeah. four match points, and yeah, then went to Juice lost it. Yeah. yeah, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, because you know, I was at lunch, and I was at lunch with a couple of new people I hadn't really met. So you're kind of like trying to be very social, and trying to be thinking, and I'm watching it on the side there. I'm like watching, like, oh, serving for the match. What do you mean you guys are still playing? And there was like still yes. going. On. I was yeah. just like, could we just finish this now? No. Because I was going to be so active. We went to a fourth set. Yeah, um, no, I, I was I was begging for it to go to go to a fourth. Unfortunately, not though. Um, and that closing out. Um, but also um, the Czech star um, in the women's Krejcikova, um, the thirty first seed beating um, Paulini um, in three sets. First, um, it was six two, um, two six, and six four. As she went on to to win that one um and her her first ever grand slam so well done second grand slam first wimbledon first one was won the first open wimbledon, my bad. yeah um but the big star on south african star we want to speak about stevie is the wheelchair champ Hotatsu Montari Monshane, and her partner yui um, kamiji um from japan and um, won the wimbledon's doubles um wheelchair final and she is now a three-time Grand Slam champion. She was a runner-up at Wimbledon last year, but has won the US Open and Roland Garros last year with Kamiji. And so we just want to give her a massive, massive shout out. And she'll be representing South Africa at the Paralympic. So she's already back in South Africa, got a hero's welcome, and has now been essentially said, job's not finished. You know, member mentality. <laughs> I don't we, think so. Job not, done. Bit, not thinking about that. I'm training already for um, the Paralympics, and she's going to Paris to to get that, get us that. Yeah, goal. and she's won. And she's won Roland Garros, so she's won. She's won on the clay. So yeah. she'll be going so in as a excited for her as as one of our um, Olympian prospects, which segues well into our stories of this week as we're gearing up for the Olympics. TV, I think, I believe we're Story nine days away. next week, dude. Yeah, nine dude, days. I'm like, we've actually, we've actually got our Olympic coverage planning meeting for tomorrow. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm starting to get that, but I love the Olympics. Like, yeah. don't, don't make plans with me in, in for the next month. I, I don't want to <laughs> see you. And, and if you do want to make plans, you're going to come sit on, you can come sit on my couch and watch archery and volleyball and the works next yes. year. But that's about as good as you're going to get. The month where we become experts in sports we don't know. Um, yeah, now that's the Winter um, Olympics when we start pulling out uh, curling and the likes. Exactly, exactly. But a couple notable performances um, and people to watch out for um, from the South African team. First of all, um, Benjamin Richardson powering to a 9.86 um, in the Switzerland meeting this last week 
the second ever fastest time by a South African in a hundred meters, Stevie, and the <coughs> fastest of this year. So, um, mm. I mean, he has put his name right up in the mix for um, not only as one of the fastest in South Africa and, and challenging Akani Sambine, but, you know, hopefully getting himself all the way potentially to a final because those times are unbelievable. So it's always interesting to see, you know, people are supposedly holding themselves back and don't, you know, fifth fastest this year might not mean much if people are holding back, but I mean, no one can take that time away from him. So, so well done for, to you. Well, at the end of the day, you know, that kind of time can be an Olympic winning time, you know, like, you know, we're not talking about the Bolt area. We're, we're not, we're not running nine, four nines at the moment. In 2012, we had the, like, Five of the six ever fastest ever. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, no, imagine, it. imagine running like the fourth fastest time in history, not meddling. <laughs> I mean, so, like, you got to feel for Johan Blake. I feel as well. Man was robbed of an of an era of sprinting that he would have had all to his own, yeah. as, as did some of the others, but cheapers. So yeah, we're not quite at that level. So as you said, it could in theory be a medal uh, time. So if you can one up that. He's, he's really in, in, in a strong position there. Of course, there's our gold medalist and golden gold, Tatiana Skudmarker, or was actually now Tatiana Smith. She has recently married uh, Joel Smith, who is actually um, Rachel Khaleesi's um, brother. So it's all just keeping it in the South African yeah. family. I mean, how's that, I mean, how's that for a powerhouse family lunch? And you've got Tatiana yeah. Skudmarker and Sia Khaleesi, you know, just casual couple of world records, couple of Olympic goals, couple of world cups, yeah. you know, just... No. Beast, but she, she's gone on to, she's been winning um, or meddling in all of the major events um, between the Olympics, the, the previous Olympics and, and this one. So obviously just a beast um, in breaststroke. So really excited to, to see her back. And of course, who we've already mentioned, um, Prudence Sefendiso. Um, she came third recently in the Netherlands. I'm narrowly missing out to um, Hodgkinson by you know, less than less than a second and was ahead of Australia, um, Abby Caldwell. Um, so coming coming second and she has now run six times under two minutes and i've actually just finished the Custer semenya book um so now you know i have a real understanding of what these times are meaning and uh, anything you're talking under so you know, you're basically able to be the expert now she is and and i mean Custer says how she wants to be just the mentor to these people while she can't run and i imagine she is getting a wealth of knowledge from Custer. um so hopefully prudence can take this um, form into the Olympics um, and and kind of get something really over the line and be our, our new 800 meter golden goal. Um, of course, we have um, our rowing, which is um, unfortunately didn't have a great Olympics in last year uh, or oh, last Olympics at, last time, at, yeah. um, at Tokyo. But um, we've got uh, John Smith and um, Baxter who just missed out by 0 0.11 um, seconds on meddling yesterday um in switzerland um at a regatta there so although not meddling they are right in the running for um to get a couple um you know potentially get some medals there um for rose smith was a part of part of that unbelievable four that we all remember from the london olympics who won gold um so yeah hoping that they can also get something over the line and last one a notable mention to vian Roo, who will be the first ever south african um archer in the 12 years um to compete at the olympics at the olympic games so really excited to as you say get stuck into the archery and become a become yeah. a you know an absolute expert in it um by the end of the olympics so we'll be cheering you on yeah well, i've watched a couple of robin hood movies so i know what's plotting <laughs> Um, but Stevie, let's get into the big story of the week. And that's, first mm. of all, first off, Wade Funny Cack dropping from, um, off from the 400 meter race, um, which is heartbreak in of itself, um, yeah. and moving to the 200. And as a result, uh, Lucolo Adams is out. Um, I can't believe the, the story has unfolded in, in the most South African way possible. Um, should we get into it? Yeah, it's been a it's been a very very strange one to be honest. Um, and um, to, to, yeah, so for the viewers, basically what happened? So Wade Van Eekerk has opted out of the four hundred meters. As a result, he's going to be running the two hundred meters. Um, now it's not quite that simple. You don't just get to sort of beg and choose. You know, you have to sort of go get a, a permission, and you've only got so many slots, for example, from the African point of view, to how many assets we can send and stuff like that. And basically, what's happened is that because he made that decision. Um, he had to get, take one of the spots in the 200 meter runners, and and he has taken uh, Nicola Adams' spot. 
which means that Kola Adams is not going to the Olympics and is not going to be competing in the 200 meter. Now, he came out on social media saying this is nonsense and uh, he was threatening legal action. He was saying, you know, he had run the times, he had qualified, he'd been told he was going and uh, he was ready to go. Now, Mr. Populist Gator McKenzie, our new sports <laughs> minister, has jumped onto the bandwagon, as he's been doing with a lot of things at the moment, trying to stay very relevant, trying to stay on a lot of the topic of the issues, uh, which is good to see that he's got he's in touch. But also, at the end of the day, you know, I don't think we need to worry too much. I mean, a minister is about growing the entire sport, not just worrying about Paula Adams' Olympic dream. Um, has said <laughs> that he's going to find out what's going on and why he's, he's not going. But the biggest twist of the entire tale is a headline, which, if it's true, and this all turns out to be very true, makes the Paula Adams look a little bit silly, where it says, you agreed with it. And that is, Athletic South Africa have come out and said that he was in a meeting where he was told about it, and that there was no protestation from him that from the basically for the size of he kind of sat in a meeting took it and then went to social media after and said this is nonsense um mm-hmm. so it's all been a very interesting story now this is what athletics of africa came out and said and actually um, he's actually suing athletics of africa now yeah yeah, so he's he's taking he's taking uh, um, he's trying to take them to court. Uh, a letter from the Les African coordinator Ezekiel Sepeng has emerged, where the confederation has claimed to have discussed the decision during a telephonic meeting with Adams, his coach Kerry okay, Postumus, and his agent Pete Van Zayl. And so apparently, Adams picked up a hamstring injury earlier this year, and uh, he told us that he'd be ready to compete in May, um, but he had turned down his selection for the African Athletics Championships in, because he, in last month, because he was still recovering, so it was supposed to be back in May, now it's in mm-hmm. June and he's saying no, he can't run. Um, he told the Federation he would compete twice, 6th of July and 9th of July, to prove he was fit, um, and on the 6th of July he did run, but he clocked 21.50. Mm-hmm. Um, which is slower time. than uh, for Nico's season best of 20.29, almost a second and a half slower. Mm-hmm. And he then mm-hmm. pulled out of the event on the 9th of July. Yeah. So apparently all parties agreed on this uh, telephonic call that after the poor result, he was not ready for the Olympic Games. And the coach actually indicated that he was in his fourth week of rehabilitation. And apparently as they said that they should, he should focus on his recovery and prepare for next season. Uh, yeah. He said that Sepeng has claimed that Adams had not only been informed of the decision, but had accepted it, saying during the group call, you were given the opportunity to express your feelings about the decision and you agreed with it. Yeah. So, no, all very bizarre. And now Wade um, will be, I guess, filling in his position at the 200 meter and is eligible to run the 4x100 and 4x400 meter relays, although it's not actually officially been picked in either of those teams. So it um, will be interesting to see how that plays out. Stevie, let's quickly get into the predictions for this week. Um, Mm. And we've got the second England versus West Indies test match where England won that one convincingly. And then we've got South Africa versus Portugal and Australia versus Georgia. Let's start with the England versus West Indies at Trent Bridge um, beginning tomorrow, um, which will be Thursday. Let's start off with runs and then we'll go. I assume we're both going for, for, are we both? Well, who knows? Yes, probably. Okay. So, so I, I um, let's let, let's start with the runs, and I'll I'll, I'll count us down. We'll, we'll we'll just say how much we think they're going to win by. Um, let's go with three, two, one, one eighty. England by hundred, hundred eighty. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'm going hundred. Okay, you're going hundred in wickets. Are you ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Eight. eight. Yeah, I thought you were going to go with eight as well. Okay. Do you want to move or I'll do you down, want me to move? I'll go, I'll, go, I'll go down to seven. Yeah, oh, that's shaky. Zach, Zach Crawley's going to nick off just before I can tell. I get my yeah. prediction right. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that, that they need 40 to win and all of a sudden they're you know, 10 for two. More like they need one to win and he goes for a massive cover, cover drive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but let's go South Africa versus Portugal, Stevie. Uh, have you got a number in mind for this match? Yeah. Okay, so do I. Let's count down in three, two, one. Borco Box by, by 50. 35. Okay, I'm 35, you're 50. Kuhn Horn's um, going to have to go off the, off the bench. Uh, put your, all your money on Makazole, Mapimpi, and Kirtley Aronsa, I'll tell you that. Triple yeah. captain them both if you can. Um, and the interesting one in Australia versus Georgia, how do you see, well, I'm actually not going to ask you, I'll find out afterwards, um, in your prediction, but have you got a score in mind for this one, Stevie? Uh, yeah. As do I, I'm going to count us in, in three, two, one, Australia, Australia by, by 20. 
Okay, 17 to 20. Okay, well, Stevie, thank you for the show. Glad to have you back, old lad. Um, good to get through a whole lot. And as you said, we'll be gearing up um, more and more towards the Olympics. As next week's episode will be just before it begins. So we'll do a big um, intro of all, all the front runners, but and we'll probably know if um, Paul Adams actually ends up going to the Olympics um, or whether he's still suing. Um, at, um, at the Olympics South Africa. Stevie, have a good week. Thank you very much for, yourself. for the episode. Um, everyone, please smash a like and subscribe and share this with your aunties and uncles, as always. Yeah, and all over the world as well. I don't even care that they're not South African. They deserve to hear South African stories. Exactly, exactly. Stevie, thank you very much. That's been episode 26. Um, we'll see you next week.